Study after survey after news report all seem to agree. Teenagers want and need better access to mental health services. Demand for treatment for eating disorders, substance use disorders, anxiety and depression all increased over the past few years, even as mental health professionals, schools and government scrambled to meet teens where they were. The word crisis gets used a lot, so let's find out where this stands and what's needed from Kathy Short, Executive Director of School Mental Health Ontario. She's coming to us from just outside Hamilton. And here in our studio, Quam McKenzie, CEO of the Wellesley Institute and a professor of psychiatry at the University of Toronto. Joe Henderson, Executive Director of Youth Wellness Hubs Ontario and Director of the Margaret and Wallace McCain Centre for Child, Youth and Family Mental Health at CAMH, the Center for Addiction and Mental Health. You win. That's the longest title I've ever heard in my life. <laughs> Annie Kidder is here, Executive Director of People for Education. No, you win. That's a nice short title. Thank you. And Mahalia Dixon is here. She is a Youth Engagement Specialist, also with CAMH, and it's great to have you four here in our studio. You again. You two for the first time. And Kathy, thanks for joining us from just outside the hammer. I want to start by reading something that was in the Globe and Mail last month, and that will set up the discussion to come. This from feature writer Aaron Anderson. Sheldon, if you would, let's bring up the graphic here. Early on in the pandemic, the predictions were grim. Scientific papers warned of a, quote, mental health tsunami. Experts worried about escalating anxiety and depression. But the big picture theme of the pandemic, according to a growing collection of data, is not panic, but resilience. As a new international study led by Canadian researchers and published Wednesday in the British Medical Journal suggests, humanity has, for the most part, quote, made the best of a difficult situation. According to the study, university students and seniors experienced minimal to small increases in depression, that is, enough to cause a blip on a mental health scale, but not enough to dramatically upset a person's day-to-day. There was no evidence of an overall spike in depression and anxiety among teenagers, at least in that first peak pandemic year. Okay, this was a big shocking revelation, I know, to a lot of people. And a couple of weeks ago, Quam, you were on that program, actually, when we talked about this. Uh, we did a program on this Canadian survey in which the notion of a tsunami just was not there. Uh, it did not happen. Uh, as many predicted. And I would kind of like to get everybody's first-hand impressions of how that sounds to them, this study. Kathy, start us off, if you would. Sure. Um, you know, I, I really appreciate that report and the um, story of resilience that it paints. But it's important to remember that our data story is, is young and still unfolding. And so we do have to hold things lightly. And, and I think what we're learning in population research doesn't always translate to the individual experience. And so, you know, we, we know there are young people out there who are really struggling. And so when they hear a report like that, they, their families, and you think about how mental health reverberates, um, you know, they're feeling some deep pain. And so that, that finding may not sit exactly right. So I think if there's, the way I look at it is if there's one thing that um, we've learned in the pandemic is that we really can't be thinking in universals. Um, that while we had some common experiences in the, in the pandemic, it landed differently for different people. Uh, we all experienced some hardship, but for some there was more loss, more grief, more challenges, more strain. So depending on circumstances, I think we have some young people um, who are actually managing okay. Um, we have some that are experiencing what I would say is more distress than disorder. And we have some kids who are really struggling. Okay, so, let me, let me jump in there line, and I'm going to get some uh, sure. reaction here in the studio as well. Annie, to you first, what are you hearing from the school systems? Uh, a lot of stress. So we survey all the principals in the province. Uh, we put out a report a few weeks ago where they definitely said, uh, compared to the beginning of the pandemic where COVID was the struggle, that to them the biggest challenge now was kids' mental health and staff mental health. Um, and that they didn't have enough access to resources and that the system itself was strained. It's not, it's an education system, it's not a healthcare system. Um, so they, they were having a hard time accessing mental health specialists 
specialists, um, and that there, the it was adding to a level of stress in the school. But they were there. The comments in the survey were amazing in terms of the principals saying the increase in behavioral problems, in um, self-regulation, and in kids in real distress was huge. And they were worried that the world thought everything had gone back to normal, and they went, everything mm -hmm. isn't back to normal, and we really want to be able to help these kids, and we don't have enough help to do it. Joe, from your standpoint. <clears throat> Yeah, well, I mean, I think it's interesting the use of language such as resilience is a little bit problematic from my perspective. Okay. You know, in part, we're expecting young people to adapt to change, and really, we need the systems to adapt. Right. Um, we need the systems to adjust and create sort of less stressful environments, as well as uh, supporting young people to cope more effectively. As long as we have systems in place that are not reflective of the needs of young people, then we're really, we're, we're situating them in contexts that are likely to lead to stress, distress, and, and as Kathy said, um, higher levels of disorder as well. Quam, are we in the midst of a teen mental health crisis in your view? I think that it's, um... I wanted to congratulate the people who did the study. I thought it was a great study. The thing about the study was it was a study of the whole world. And um, everybody, as Cathy was saying, experienced it differently. If you look at the Canadian data, or even further, if you look at the uh, Ontario data, it's very different. So in 2019, uh, school surveys, 21% of kids had uh, mental health problems. 2021, 26% had mental health problems. 60% were saying that their mental health had been affected by uh, COVID. And um, also, and very worrying, one in five kids in 2021 said they had deliberately hurt themselves in the last year. How do you define that? Well, it's deliberately hurts. I mean, people scratch themselves, some people are cutting, but they're not, it's not trying to um, uh, necessarily uh, commit uh, suicide. It's sometimes uh, trying to relieve tension hmm. by hurting yourself, by uh, scratching yourself, by cutting yourself to relieve anxiety and depression. This is worrying. So um, we could talk about whether uh, there's a post-COVID tsunami, the, not that we're post-COVID, mm -hmm. um, or not, but we have significant issues in teen mental health that we haven't dealt with. Yeah. Okay. I've purposely left you to the end because you're the youngest among us and um, you have your contacts on this story in a way that perhaps others don't. So why don't you share which, where you think we're at on this right now? Yeah, I mean, I think as folks have already said, there's a lot to be said when it comes to young folks' mental health. Um, and when thinking about data specifically, like data, of course, not negating how important it is. It is incredibly important. But it's also equally, if not more important, to be looking directly at what young folks are saying, right? And what we're hearing is that young folks are saying, I'm struggling, I need support, um, you know, I'm not getting the services that I need or the services that I'm getting, you know, they're not really matching what I'm mm -hmm. experiencing, right? And um, of course, we know that the experiences of young folks also change tremendously, right, as they age and especially during the pandemic and so much societal change as well. It's impossible to sort of keep up for young folks in certain ways. And so um, despite the fact that, yeah, like overall, um, some folks are thriving, some folks are doing really well, some folks are also struggling. And it's important that we're looking at things at an individual level, um, not just at like a global level or a larger scale level to get a real picture of what's happening for young folks' mental health. That's a point that's clearly emerging as we mm -hmm. uh, make our way through this whole thing. Joe, I want to follow up with you. How do, how do you tell the difference between what's just typical teenage angst that everybody goes through when they become a teenager or what is something deeper and more profound, perhaps related to the pandemic? Well, I guess I would ask a different question, and that is... You didn't like the question I asked? <laughs> <laughs> uh, who deserves support? And from my perspective, it actually doesn't matter how I define, you know, is it this or is it that? Where on the continuum is it? What's critical is how does the young person feel? What are they saying they need? And how are we responding as adults, as systems? Um, I think that's the critical question. Once we create opportunities for young people to connect, we get to know them, we can engage with them, then we have an opportunity to understand what's really going on. We can, we can start to differentiate between is this a, 
a, a, a need that's arising in the moment that we can respond to sort of briefly and, and support a young person. Uh, you know, is it a challenge that just exceeds their coping uh, capabilities and, and a little bit of investment will support them? Or is it something deeper, bigger that's emerging in the context of something that'll last for longer? And we can adjust what kinds of services we offer in response to that. But the first and most important question to ask is how are you doing? What do you need? I take your point. I'm going to see if I can come up with a supplementary question here that will meet with a little more favor. Uh, <laughs> and Quam, I'm going to put it to you, which is, I, I understand that if you're a kid and you're in trouble, it kind of doesn't matter if you're in trouble because of A or B or C. Could be something related to your family, could be something related to the pandemic, whatever. But do you make a distinction or should we make a distinction between those who are just suffering from what you might call typical teenage angst versus something you picked up in the pandemic? I think we do, we should make a distinction, but that doesn't mean that people don't need support or help. The distinction is about uh, maybe what people need to help them thrive rather than whether they should be getting support. So, yes, I mean, the fact that uh, teenage years can be rough doesn't mean to say, OK, we do nothing about that, we don't make it better, we don't give people tools to be able to work through that. We don't say that. We say, hey, well, just because it was, it sucks for some people <laughs> doesn't mean it's got to, it's OK. It's not OK. And I, I, I really like what Joe was saying. Let's turn it around and say, what do teenagers need to thrive? Mm -hmm. And what do we need to do to help them thrive? Mm -hmm. And uh, listening to what people think they need, uh, help, you know, sort of uh, trying to work out what we can do, both professionally and sometimes not professionally, what peers can do to help each other, how schools can be set up to help kids thrive, uh, how we can give people um, uh, skills to self-regulate. There are loads of things we can do uh, to help people. And um, I, I think, uh, personally, I think if I, uh, during my teenage years, had been uh, listened to a bit more <laughs> and given more skills, mm. Uh, then I would have had a better teenage uh, teenage years and I'd have wasted less time, quite honestly. You still turned out okay, Quinn. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but think of what could have happened. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Kathy, let's go to you. Uh, first of all, School Mental Health Ontario is the name of your organization. Tell us what you do. Uh, what we try to do is support school districts across Ontario with a, a really systematic approach uh, to school mental health. Um, as you can imagine, it's a very complex thing. And what we try to do, and, and sort of going back to the first question, is um, when we think about sort of this idea of crisis or tsunami, sometimes that leads to simplistic solutions. And, and really, we need to be thinking deeply about what young people need. So I, I really like where this conversation is going. Um, really breaking it down. So what to, what does every student need in terms of their skill development in the classroom every day? What kind of mental health literacy do they need so that they can identify for themselves uh, what they, whether they're experiencing something that might need some help? How do we help teachers? How do we do stigma? And then noticing early in schools uh, when young, young people are struggling and equipping school staff for that. And then we support school mental health professionals, so that's psychologists, social workers, others who are regulated with the college, to provide brief services. And then we work with community partners to round that out in a total system of care. And let me do so a quick follow-up here. Yeah, let me do a quick follow-up, mm -hmm. which is to say, can, can you tell, based on what you're hearing back from the schools that you deal with, can you tell if we're in a worse place today as it relates to student mental health than we were pre-pandemic? You know, coming into the pandemic, we were still having child and youth mental health problems. I think one of the the sort of maybe enlightening moments that we've all had is that we're having conversations like this. Um, and so we're putting attention and support and using the investments that have been made wisely and mobilizing quickly. Um, but we do have coaches in every school district and, and they're pretty apprised to what's happening out there. And we are hearing certainly um, more, more acute concerns and more need for, for those sorts of services, but also really some excellent stories of hope and amazing things happening in classrooms every day. And I think we need to shine a light on that as well. I want to take that light and I want to shine it on your report, Annie, because I think one of the things that emerged from your report was the notion that if we're going to improve the mental health of students, we may first have to improve the mental health of teachers. 
Can you make that link for us? Well, yeah, and I also want to link back to Kwame's point about skills, because I think that there's the kind of short term, uh, you know, is there an emergency and how do we deal with it? And I hope we're not just going, if it's not a tsunami, then who cares? Mm. You know, there's obviously a storm. Um, but, so there's two parts to this then. If we think about the skills and if we think about what we should and could be doing in the education system to recognize uh, these as teachable, learnable skills that start from early childhood and go up all the way through the system and that are not little add-ons, not a little square on the curriculum going, you should look at social emotional learning too, <laughs> but actually understanding them as serious so that when you hit a crisis as a young person, hopefully, not everybody, uh, you'll have more skills to be able to deal with it. You'll understand how you're feeling. You'll be able to communicate how you're feeling to other people. You'll know if you need help, which is a really good indicator of whether or not you have those skills that you go, I'm actually in trouble now. I need to go to somebody to ask. So there's a long-term thing here that hopefully we're learning from, uh, which is a significant change needs to be made in schooling so that um, we, we deal with partly an inequity here because some families can go access help, have more wherewithal to kind of have these conversations at home. But And I'm not saying teachers should become mental health experts or deal with uh, mental illness, but it is important that we're thinking about what needs to change in the system. But yes, another part of the report that came out was that there's a lot of stress among all school staff too. They also have gone through a pandemic, but they're, they also felt there wasn't enough staff support so that then you've got kids who are really struggling and less access to staff, then more staff going, this is, I'm really, now I'm in a crisis, I'm gonna take a leave, less access to staff, more kids struggling. So there is a kind of uh, just spiral, uh, one principal called it a downward spiral that takes mm. place. But to me, that skills piece is a key long-term piece here where that shouldn't be something that only, you know, families with the kind of, uh, only certain families have access mm. to. Would you make that connection between improved mental health for students needing to start with improved mental health for teachers? Uh, I would like to see both simultaneously, but absolutely. We know that the mental health of young people is affected by the mental health of the adults who surround them in their lives. And school, of course, is a, a context within which um, many young people, most young people, are engaged at younger ages. And so ensuring that um, uh, teachers and other school staff have uh, their their own skills around mental health, their mm -hmm. own literacy, and, and the supports in place to support their mental health will be an important piece of, of movement moving forward. Can I get you on that, Mahalia? I mean, we, we seem to want teachers to be experts in so many different things these days, uh, beyond just uh, reading, writing, and arithmetic, so to speak. Do you think they can be experts in, not, maybe not experts, but are, they, are they, how big a piece of the mental health solution for, for students are teachers in the first place? I think they can definitely play a significant role, right? But I think there's also a distinction between capacity and expertise. Right. And I think that it's important that we're talking about capacity here, right? Like it's, we definitely don't want to put too much pressure on teachers yeah. and then, that, then they'll just crumble, you know, because they already have so much on their plates. Um, but it means that they have the capacity to identify different things and their students as they see them. They spend the most time with their young people, right? Even more than their parents a lot of times. They should be able to identify it and then link them to other services whether it be more guidance counselors in schools, counselors in schools, psychologists, and then also linking them to community resources as well. So for me, when I see teachers, it's that um, liaison role, right? That be able to, okay, I see my student is struggling. How can I help you? And maybe I can help you by linking you to this other resource with other folks who are experts, right? And who do have the capacity, the time, the energy, and the resources, really. The resource is the key thing here as well to support these young people in, the, in, the, um, in, their, in their communities, right? So that way they're not going out of their communities. They're not going, um, out of um, their comfort, I guess, to access services, and instead they're getting what they need as it's coming to them. Let me pick yeah. up on that. Joe, I guess we'll go back to first principles here. Mm -hmm. Should the school be the hub of a student or a young person's mental health experience? Schools have a really important role to play, um, and community-based services mm -hmm. are essential. Uh, so our most vulnerable young people, for example, may not be attending school. School may not be a place that feels comfortable for them to attend, uh, and certainly not to receive their mental health services. So we really need options. We need options that, um, that reflect where expertise sits, where young people are and need to be and want to be. Um, and so that's going to include schools, but it's also going to include community. Let me get you on that, Quam. Where What should be the hub where students 
can get those mental health services? Well, I think that we have just gone through a tumultuous time. Everybody knows that um, COVID has been difficult for people's mental health. And it's not clear to me that we have a plan of how to deal with uh, some of the people who've been most affected, who've had their lives significantly interrupted. We don't necessarily have a catch-up plan for their education. And we don't necessarily have a catch-up plan for their social development and their mental health development. And so when I hear these sort of conversations, what are we going to do about staff mental health uh, in schools, teacher capacity, who links to whom, you sort of think, wouldn't it be good to have a plan? <laughs> <laughs> who's, who's responsible for coming up with the plan? Well, uh, the, I mean, obviously, uh, you would want both the Ministry of Education and the Ministry of Health to be working together to try and work out what the plan should be and who does what. Because there are some things about um, promoting wellness and uh, not about mental illness, about promoting mm -hmm. wellness and trying to get people as well as they were before, right? Do you know and if they're doing that, incidentally? Sorry? Health and education, yeah. do you know no. if they are, in fact, doing that? Yeah. But Kathy can says help no. you. Okay. <laughs> but Kathy <laughs> can help okay. you on that. Okay. Um, but, <laughs> but, but I'm just saying, having... If I don't know the plan, and if parents don't know the plan, hmm. then the plan is not being implemented, because everybody should know what the plan is. And it would be great to actually be clear what the plan is, because if we know what the plan is, and if students know what the mm -hmm. plan is, that is part of the issue. Somebody's got you. <laughs> okay, Somebody's well, got you back. Let me get that Kathy... changes how you... Sure. Yeah. I'm going to get Kathy and Annie on this, and let me just preface the question by saying, health's an $80 billion a year ministry. Education's a $35 billion mm -hmm. a year ministry. So they got a lot on their plate. And whether the two of them can actually speak to each other is a very open question. Kathy, why don't you come in and tell us whether you think there actually is a coordinated plan between health and education to resolve this? I would say there, there are uh, some really important things happening right now. So there is actually a comprehensive school mental health strategy. And to, to Kwam's part, uh, point, if we aren't communicating that well, um, we need to do that because there are our folks who are actually enacting this day by day. And I'd love to give an example of that uh, that I think would be resonating. Um, but to your other point, in terms of collaboration across sectors, that is absolutely happening um, at the sort of intermediary level. So the level of folks like me who are working with folks like Joe, folks like the Knowledge Institute, uh, Children's Mental Health Ontario, we've come together to create a vision and a strategy called Right Time, Right Care. And it is exactly what Quam is talking about in terms of how we need to work together across our systems where schools are doing really excellent work with wellness promotion and uh, uh, prevention and early intervention and our community partners are, are providing excellent services uh, with intensive care and many elements of that are well underway. So I just I would want your audience to have some confidence that there are some really excellent things already happening um, and our problem is one of communication and scale. So we have to be thinking about scalable uh, sustainable solutions together. Okay, that's good to know, but I heard you say no, Annie. Well, I, and I, I feel bad because School Mental Health Ontario is an incredible organization doing incredible work. So there are things going on, but I think they're often the kind of beautiful exceptions, as we like to call them, so that what, what people working in schools, they are, they're not experiencing a plan. And one of our calls in our most recent report, which we have been calling for since the beginning of the pandemic, is a task force. Task force are the answer to everything. But to make sure that we have people at the table with the experience and the expertise from health and education so that we're, we're actually understanding as a public, as parents, as staff in schools, as kids, it's like there is, there's Everybody's gotten together. Everybody's talked to each other. They've tried to work out. So they've listened to principals who are going, that's great that there's a plan over here, but I, I can't access community mental health, or I actually don't know enough about it, so I don't know how to do it, or I'm so overwhelmed by all the other things I have to do. I don't have a staff person. I just need a, 
you know, you could find out, I actually just need a person paid part-time to be the community liaison, liaison who could help me find that. But I, we are, I don't think there's a good enough, strong enough plan. I think it is really important that we're able to scale really great examples of things that are happening on the ground. But they often rely on heroes or people who really know how to work the system well. And what we need is something more comprehensive than that. And in my experience, which is for over a very long time, ministries aren't that good at talking to each other or kind of sharing turf and understanding how they have to be work, have, how they have to work together. But I do want to say, School Mental Health Ontario has been an incredible innovation in this work because there's a lot more there now than there used to be. Yeah, and I, I'd, I'd agree. Mm -hmm. um, you know, um, Kathy and School Mental Health Ontario are doing great things. Joe's doing great things, and various people are doing great mm -hmm. things. Uh, and I wasn't uh, wanted, I don't want to be misinterpreted to say that there is nothing happening. Mm. I was specifically interested in the post COVID, and I keep on saying post COVID, mm. though I don't think we're post COVID. I was trying to think of the catch up. Yeah. What is the specific plan for the catch up? That was that. That was the question that I had. Catch up, referring to? Well, people have gone. People have missed time at school. Uh, there are increased rates of mental health problems. Uh, Twenty-five percent of kids have had a deteriorating relationship with their parents. That does not bode well for their mental health. Mm -hmm. Yeah, some of those teens are going to be moving out of school into university, perhaps. You know, how is that going to work? Yeah, it's all of that sort of. We went through a hard time. People gave up a lot. Who, how are we making that up to get people back to where they were? We said we were going to build back better. Mm -hmm. yeah. Have we actually dealt with the issues that have come out of the uh, pandemic so far? And that was the question I had. Yeah. What's that plan? And if I can interrupt, as is my won't, ask my husband. <laughs> um, it's, it's, that, it's exactly that. The principals are going, they're going, things aren't back to normal. Don't just go, yippee, that's done, because things are not back to normal in school. So what is the plan? And it's a kind of, and it's, my, you know, we talk a lot about learning loss, but we're not talking about catch up in a, in a more global kind of way. And I think that that's why there was a kind of cri de coeur from principals going, something's going on here and people aren't paying enough attention. Well, Jill, let me go to you on that. Yes. What, is a, what does a catch up plan look like? Absolutely. Well, I want to uh, sort of jump off of something Kwam said, which is just the importance of thinking not just about one piece, but in fact, yeah. thinking about the whole picture. And uh, when we talk to youth, when we partner with young people and, and you know, the kind of work that Mahalia does to support us in doing that, what we hear is young people say, you know, I'm not divided up into health and mental yeah, health yeah, and yeah, substance yeah. use and education yeah. and family relationships. It's not all separate. It's holistic. It's all me. And our services need to be integrated. I need to be able to walk in the door and say, hey, I need support. And we as a system figure out what are the services we need to offer? How do we engage? I got bad news for you. That's not the way government works. Government works in silos, right? <laughs> there's health, there's education, there's youth services, yes. right? There, so how do you, how do you, I mean, you're basically asking <laughs> silos to talk to each other, which they're Absolutely. not really good at. They're not good at it, and we still have to try. We still have to do it. Something like Youth Wellness Hubs Ontario, School Mental Health Ontario as well. We, we're all about pulling together different pieces of the, um, the lack of system, all of the different services. Uh, you start with people and organizations who have a shared vision around better outcomes for young people, with young people. Uh, you start there and you build. And it can be done, we are doing it. And, you know, it takes, uh, it takes leadership, it takes a commitment to innovation, but we can't be held back by the way things have always yeah. been. If we sit with the way things have always been, we're going to have the same outcomes. Mahalia, mm -hmm. give us your sense in our remaining few moments here about what you think a holistic response to catch up looks like. Yeah, I mean, I think, first of all, if we're asking young folks to adapt to chaos, then I think that services can also learn to adapt. People with decades of experience can also <laughs> learn to adapt at the same time and can probably do it even better, right? Than young people who are, this is your first time going at it. So I think that when we're talking about developing holistic services, is looking at young people at a specific community-based level, not at like a large uh, population-based level, but specific communities. And going in, seeing what's happening, what do you need? It's about ideally having these hubs that you mentioned earlier 
everywhere, right? School is a hub, community is a hub, hospital is a hub, family is a hub, everywhere is a hub that young people can go in and get access to different resources that can then um, launch them, I guess, into you know, a better area of their life, right? Launch them into other services that they need, launch them into university, launch them into career, launch them into whatever it is that they want to be. And so for really when we're talking about uh, holistic services and building holistic services, it's going to individual young people asking, what do you need? And then scaling from there and taking a culturally responsive lens, right? Taking um, a community responsive lens, a, geographic, a geographically responsive lens, all of that put into one. Um, and of course, there isn't a one size fits all situation at all. Mm -hmm. Generalization is where we get into a lot of trouble. Um, but it's taking care and taking time and being mindful and creating these services by young people uh, and listening to them and their uh, their desires and what they're explaining as they, what they need for services. Kathy, I think I need you to weigh in by telling us what the consequences are if we don't get this right. We need to get this right. And, and I think we've got a lot of folks working on that. Um, I think Mahalia is speaking a lot of wisdom here and it, what, what she's saying is very much what we're hearing from young people. They want to be involved. Uh, they want to be part of this solution and they, they have a role to play in making it better in this support system that uh, has been described. So Annie, if you're, if you're a teenager in school having issues right now on this, where do you turn? What do your people tell you that you're well, supposed to do? I I think hopefully you can turn to your teacher, the actual, you know, the grown up that you see the most. And hopefully your teacher will have enough knowledge and skill to be able to go, I actually think you need to go over here, talk to the guidance counselor or whatever. There still is that hard problem of, I can see you do have a problem. I'm not sure if you're going to find the, the resource you need. But I think that right now what's important is that we are we have systems, which are hubs, that, that say, we, do, we want to hear from you. We want to have this conversation. And there are, after we put out our report, there were two principals who talked, who I think were both in Toronto, who had incredible centers in their schools. They had a wellness center. You could go there. Somebody, you could find somebody else to talk to. So there is attention being paid. I think we are past the kind of hopefully, the kind of stigma as a problem. So stigma is less of a problem, but now it's resources. So people understand that this is not some weird thing that happens to somebody else. I'm not pointing at you. <laughs> <laughs> I wondered what that was. <laughs> <laughs> so that's some weird thing that just happens to call me. Um, but that we all struggle at various times in our life and that it's important that we're paying attention to this and, and being, you know, articulating this in the system. You know what i got to so say? You know For a show about a really serious I'm topic, sorry. we've had way too much fun out here today. But anyway, maybe that's good. Um, it is. Uh, I, Mr. Director, I want to be able to thank everybody for coming on our program tonight. And uh, I'd love you to tell me where you want to start. Okay. Bring the boxes up if you would. There they are in the top right corner. Kathy Short, School Mental Health Ontario. Thanks for being there for us on the line from the hammer. And in the bottom left-hand corner, Joe Henderson, with a title too long to get into right now. Let's just say Youth, Wental, Youth Wellness Hubs Ontario. Uh, and Mahalia Dixon, Cam H, Youth Engagement Specialist. And then over there on the other side of the table. The weird guy. <laughs> Quam McKenzie, Wellesley Institute, University of Toronto, Annie Kidder, People for Education. Okay, that's it. Get us out of here, everybody. Thank you. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism.